Welcome everybody to NAB. Uh, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we meet today, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, and I pay my respects to their elders, past and present, and any elders who are with us here today. So NAB is very pleased to again be supporting um, this forum uh, and together with our partners, the Shared Value Project, and I'd like to particularly acknowledge um, Peter Yates and Helen Steele, who've been great partners to work with. Like many of you, uh, NAB is on a shared value journey. And so we welcome the opportunity to hear from the experts and others experience in this space. We're really drawn to the concept of shared value at NAB because it speaks to our purpose as a bank. We're focused on helping people be good with their money, championing fairer banking and building stronger and more prosperous communities and contributing to conversations that support Australia's future. Last year, we supported the paper published by the Shared Value Initiative, Banking on Shared Value, to better understand how this concept can be applied to the finance sector. The paper articulates how banks are essential to solving today's most pressing challenges, and that addressing these challenges is critical to the growth and success of banks. It outlines the role of banks through the lens of shared value, reflecting on what we are experiencing right now demand from a growing number of customers to work with them to seize opportunities to create financial value by addressing unmet social and environmental needs. For a long time now, governments have typically been responsible for areas such as affordable housing, alternative e um, energy and agricultural development. But there's growing recognition that private capital is essential to meeting the scale of the needs in these areas. There is an evolving market for banks centred around creating shared value and the ones that understand and respond to this are the ones that will succeed. The annual value of global business opportunities in social and environmental markets is projected to be upwards of $3 trillion annually by 2050. The estimated financing gap for small and medium sized businesses totals $2.1 trillion and 2.5 billion people around the world still need access to quality banking services. The opportunities are there, and many of our largest clients, from institutional investors to corporations, are demanding offerings that cater to these new markets, and we're actively working with them to help them realise this potential. Last year, uh, together with my colleague Steve Lambert, who is here with us today, who looks after our debt capital markets business, we launched Australia's first bank-issued climate bond that raised $300 million to finance renewable energy infrastructure across the country. And in partnership with the Impact Investing Australia, we launched the NAB Impact Investment Readiness Fund. The fund aims to bridge the gap in the Australian market between mission-driven organisations in need of funding and investors actively seeking impact investment opportunities. Later today, you'll hear from Damien Chester from our NAB care team. He's led work to change the way we manage customer hardship cases at the bank by reimagining our internal approach and processes to improve efficiencies and enhance our customer experience, the NABCARE team last year assisted 15,000 customers who were in distress, with nearly half the cases resolved in one day. And Sasha Corville, who leads our work in natural capital, together with our agribusiness bankers, will share with you how we have worked with our agriculture customers to help them manage risks and harness opportunities arising from better management of natural capital assets, such as water, soil and energy resources. This drive to create value for our customers and our communities is at the heart of our business. We want to make sure that our customers have the right products, the confidence to manage their finances and are supported in times of hardship and also have access to fair and affordable finance. While we have made inroads, we acknowledge that we have a long way to go and still significant challenges ahead. We've grappled with, we're still grappling with what creating shared value truly looks like for our business, um, but it is pleasing that we can today share some progress with you. But it wouldn't have been possible without opportunities like today to connect with other pioneers and learn from the experts. And obviously, there is no greater expert than our keynote speaker this morning, Mark Kramer, co-founder and managing director of FSG and director of the Shared Value Project. As you know, Mark is, is the managing director of FSG, so is the co-author with Michael Porter of the seminal article, Creating Shared Value, How to Reinvent Capitalism and Unleash a Wave of Innovation and Growth, which was published in the Harvard Business Review in 2011. 
and of course he has authored many papers since on this subject, as well as working with organisations around the world to bring shared value to life. NAB has been uh, extremely privileged to work with Mark and his team on a number of fronts, and so I'm delighted that he is with us today for this important event. Please join with me in welcoming Mark Kramer. It's a real pleasure to be back here in Australia. Uh, I travel all over the world, uh, but I rarely get as warm a reception uh, as I get here in Australia. So it is a genuine pleasure to be back. And it's a particular pleasure to see the evolution of the Shared Value Project that uh, Peter Yates and Helen and Steele and Rod Ellis Jones have done such a terrific job of pulling together. Because uh, as Helen said, two years ago this was the first introduction of the idea of shared value in Australia. And last year was really the beginning of the discussions about the idea of creating a shared value project that would really embed this idea in Australian companies, Australian nonprofits, government uh, organizations here as well. And it is so wonderful to see it come to fruition uh, with an active staff, an active membership, uh, and more and more examples and enthusiasm for this idea of shared value here in Australia. And as I wander around the world, you know, I have to say, um, as Paula said, there are a number of articles that Michael Porter and I have written over the years. Uh, they always cause a bit of a stir when they come out. Usually four years later, everyone has forgotten about them. Uh, but it's been quite remarkable to see how the momentum all over the world for this idea of shared value has continued to build. Uh, in addition to the shared value project here, there's one starting in India. Uh, there are others under discussion in Thailand, in Korea, in Colombia, in uh, Russia. Uh, there is continued momentum on the part of CEOs and business leaders around the world. Uh, our uh, next annual Shared Value Summit, our fifth summit, will be in New York uh, in a few weeks. Uh, you're all welcome to come. Uh, but the attendance for that event keeps growing. And what's even more important, the seniority of the people coming from companies, from businesses, from government, keeps elevating. And that's a terrifically powerful sign. Uh, we started an executive education course uh, at Harvard Business School last year, sold out. We'll do it again this year. And we're beginning to embed teaching cases on shared value in the Harvard Business School curriculum. Uh, a year from now, we hope there will be a uh, capstone course that every Harvard MBA will take on creating shared value. And we're seeing other business schools around the world begin to build this into their work as well. So the momentum for this idea keeps growing. And in some ways, it's growing in some unexpected places. When we wrote the article, we weren't thinking too much about nonprofit organizations and civil society. But we've seen a tremendous uptake on the part of international NGOs. We've actually formed a working group of 15 of the largest international NGOs, groups like Save the Children, who I know are represented here today. And the CEOs of these groups are now meeting every couple months to share with each other their thinking about how to create shared value strategies that enable them to partner with business in a different way, to develop for-profit efforts with business that serve their mission as a nonprofit. And of course, the power of this is the scale on which business can operate. Because around the world, I see so many worthy and excellent nonprofits struggling to figure out how to get to scale, how to begin to address the magnitude of the problems they've taken on. And the challenge of raising money and raising more money and raising even more money just gets harder. But if you can find a business model that addresses the social problem, then it scales itself. You have access to the resources of companies, you have access to the capital markets, and you have a sustainable solution that doesn't need to depend on government, doesn't need to depend on raising more money all the time, but can really operate and make a difference on the problem. We've just begun working with a group in India that has developed an approach around affordable housing 
and they've looked at the market for housing by the millions of Indians that are moving to the major cities and end up in the slums in the cities. And they said many of these people have an income. They just don't have a regular job. And they're paying rent, and the rent keeps going up each year, and they could afford a house for the rent they're paying, but the banks aren't set up to handle applications from people whose income is in the informal economy. And there isn't really appropriate housing. And they worked with developers, and they worked with architects, and developed a model where they could build an apartment for $3,000 a unit and sell it profitably for 6000 And this could accommodate a small family. And they, over about two years, began to get developers interested in actually pursuing this, not as philanthropy, but as a new market. And they realized they had to create a whole ecosystem of financing around it because, again, there needed to be a way for these people to obtain mortgages. They clearly could afford to pay them because they were paying more than that in rent every month and had been for years, but they had no opportunity for ownership. And there are now already 50,000 housing units that have been developed on this model. And there is an entirely new industry in India for affordable housing. And it's just one of the many examples I see again and again about new business models that create economic opportunity in solving social problems in places we just haven't thought to look before. So much about the mindset shift that is at the core of shared value is simply about looking at places and markets and opportunities that we've ignored in the past because they weren't part of the conventional way of doing business. And so, as I've said, one of my great pleasures is going around the world and coming across all of these fascinating examples of business and nonprofits and government building new relationships and finding new solutions to social problems. And I always enjoy when people come up to me and describe to me the latest shared value initiative that they're doing that they're so excited about. And the only problem is about a third of the time what they're describing to me is actually philanthropy. It's not shared value. And about another third of the time what they're describing to me is actually corporate social responsibility. And it's not shared value. And so what I really want to spend a few minutes this morning talking with you about is what shared value really is and what it isn't. Because I think it has become, as the term has become so popular, which is a wonderful thing, it also has been broadened to cover so many corporate activities that really aren't shared value. At its core, shared value is about business strategy. It's not another name for corporate social responsibility. It's not another name for philanthropy. It's about corporate strategy. And so let's take a few minutes and talk about what corporate strategy is. And I'll channel my co-author, Michael Porter, here, who is the uh, world expert on competitive advantage and corporate strategy. Because there's a lot of confusion about what a strategy is. People sometimes say, you know, my strategy is to be number one, or my strategy is to be the best in my industry, or to have a 30% market share, or to consolidate the market, or to delight every customer. Those are all wonderful things. Those are not strategies. The purpose of a strategy in business is to create a superior economic return through a sustainable competitive advantage. Now, there are two parts to a competitive advantage, strategy and operational effectiveness. Because you can have the best strategy in the world, but if you are not running your company efficiently, effectively, using the best practice in your industry, you won't succeed. But conversely, operational effectiveness isn't enough by itself. Because you may find a better way of doing business, but your competitors will find that same better way sooner or later. 
operational effectiveness is simply best practice in the industry and you can gain a temporary advantage if you're ahead but it's very very hard to sustain that advantage over time so you need both operational effectiveness and strategy and shared value is relevant to both of these when companies save energy save water reduce their environmental footprint when they find ways of increasing the productivity and incomes of their suppliers, when they find ways of educating their workforce and improving their ability to attract employees, these are all operational effectiveness. And these are all examples of shared value, where there is a societal value that's being created at the same time as the business value. But I think the more important part of shared value is as it relates to corporate strategy. And strategy is about making a set of choices. It's about the value proposition that you offer your customer. And if you want to achieve a superior economic return that is sustainable over time, there are really only two ways to do it. You can have a good product that you offer at the lowest price. And everything about your operation, your activities, your value chain is focused on driving out cost so that you are the low cost provider. The other way is to have a premium price for a product that meets the particular needs of a particular market segment. And everything you do is designed to meet those customers' needs in a way better than anybody else. And therefore, those customers will pay a premium. And nobody else can do a good as job in meeting those customers' needs without abandoning some other segment they serve. And so you have a sustainable advantage because it is very, very hard for your competitors to copy you if you have this unique and focused approach. Well, if strategy is about meeting these customer segments' needs in a customized way, then shared value opens a whole new segment of customers. <coughs> Paula mentioned the demand, the scale of financing, $3 trillion for social and environmental projects, the number of people who are unbanked in this world the opportunities and needs to finance agriculture and to finance SMEs. These are all new market opportunities, new customers for whom shared value can offer a powerful new business opportunity. And so strategy is not about being the best for everybody. It's about being the best for the particular market you serve. And shared value is enabling companies to find new markets, to find new customers, to find new ways to serve them. When NAB creates NAB Care and moves from the traditional banking model that says when someone falls behind in their debts, you lay on fees, you lay on extra interest charges, and they get deeper and deeper buried in debt. That's not a very good way of doing business. And they say, well, let's come up with a different business model that actually helps get people out of debt. And the bank has saved $7 million over the last couple of years by doing that. That's a better business model. And it's meeting the needs of people who have fallen behind in a unique way that other banks are not doing and therefore creating a competitive advantage. Uh, when AIA Life Insurance here works with Vitality and comes up with a scheme so that you can get rebates on your life insurance premiums if you engage in healthier behaviors, that is a new mechanism that lowers cost, that meets the needs of a particular market segment, and that creates a unique and sustainable competitive advantage. When Intuit, the software company, realizes that SMEs 
particularly small and medium-sized enterprises in depressed communities have a whole different set of challenges in going into business and they can actually begin to address those challenges in ways that enable these businesses to succeed. They've discovered a whole new market for their software and accounting products. When Yara, the world's leading fertilizer company, recognizes the tremendous power of agriculture in Africa, and like so many development agencies, has looked at smallhold farmers in Africa and their plight, their poverty, their inability to get resources, their inability to create yields at the level they should be creating them. Yara could say, well, you know, this is a social problem. We just sell fertilizer. We don't worry about that. But instead they said, you know, this is a huge market. Our competitive positioning has always been about dealing with smallhold farmers. But just giving them fertilizer isn't going to solve the problem. Because what a lot of development agencies have seen is they've gone in, they've provided agricultural inputs, they've provided technical assistance, they've helped farmers increase their yield, and what it's done is flood the market and drop the price and leave the farmers worse off than they were before. So Yara said, you know, if we're going to make this work, we have to give these, mar these farmers not only higher yields, but access to global markets so that they can sell their goods without flooding the market. And that's an incredibly complex thing. So they began working in Tanzania to develop an agricultural corridor that would go from the port through the width of the length of the country. And to make this agricultural corridor work, there needed to be transportation. There needed to be power. There needed to be cooling and storage. There needed to be the necessary agricultural inputs. There needed to be extension workers that could work with farmers and teach them better farming practices. At the end of the day, it took more than $2 billion in private capital and more than a $1 billion in public capital to create this corridor. But at the end of the day, it's also lifting 2 million farmers out of poverty creating 420,000 new jobs and dramatically changing the productivity, the input, the GDP of Tanzania. And it has opened a very fertile new market for Yara. So it's just one example of what we're seeing as companies really grasp the idea that shared value isn't CSR and it isn't philanthropy. It is about the decisions you make as a company about where to seek competitive advantage, how to achieve it, how to align all of your activities in ways that support that unique competitive positioning. And we're finding that when companies begin to go down this path of shared value, it's not a simple shift in mindset. It is actually a many year journey. We've worked with companies I've used as examples many times, uh, like Nestle and others, for five, six, seven, eight, nine years. And they are still finding new dimensions about what it means to embed shared value in their company. How is it linked to the capital allocation decisions of the company? How is it linked to the decisions behind which markets you enter? How is it linked to the compensation structure of your employees? So they are in fact rewarded not just on economic results, but on shared value creation as well. And as we work with companies, we see that there is a several stage path. And it begins with aspiration. In many ways, I think the most important thing that Michael Porter and I have done with the Shared Value article is raise the aspiration of business to really solve social problems at scale. Not just to do nice things on the periphery, but to raise their aspiration. And that's where it has to begin. And the next step we see after aspiration is understanding. 
to begin to understand, as you do in this room today, what shared value is and what it means for the company and its strategy and its operations. And the third layer we've seen is activities. So the company begins to actually launch some specific activities that create shared value. But activities is not the same thing as an overarching shared value strategy that guides the entire company. And that takes leadership from the top. And again, it takes changes throughout every aspect of the company's operations. And so we see that after the company has some experience with particular activities that are successful, begins a real journey. A journey that does not stop. A journey that finds more and more and more opportunities in shared value the more companies see and succeed in finding business models to address social problems. And finally, we see the results. We see two million farmers lifted out of poverty. We see a billion pounds of trans fat taken out of the American diet through Dow's Healthy Oils product. We see thousands of people not falling into bankruptcy through NAB care. We see people engaging in healthier behavior to reduce their insurance premiums. We see results that make the world a better place. And that's ultimately what shared value is about. But you only get there through those stages of aspiration, understanding, activity, the unending journey to finally get to the results. As I say, it is thrilling for me to be back here in Australia to see the progress that has been made here, to see companies really beginning to embrace that aspiration, to undertake the activities, and to go on this journey. And to see that it isn't just companies, but it is the nonprofits and it is government agencies that are finding new ways of working together around this common goal of creating shared value. So thank you for inviting me back here. I really look forward to today's conversations, and I really look forward to continuing to see the extraordinary progress that Australia is making in shared value. Thank you.